Welcome, everyone. This is our uh, our first uh, large group meeting in quite some time. So welcome to the May meeting. Um, I don't have any specific announcements this evening. So if we will, let's go ahead and get some comments from our federal and state agency representatives. I believe we have Dave Adler on the line today for the EM program. Any comments, Dave? See, Dave's on mute. Sorry about that. Dave's Dave's here now. I'm pinch hitting for Jay Mullis today, uh, who has a he's got a mouthful of Novocaine and it's in no position to speak to the group, <laughs> but he's doing fine. Um, thanks again to everybody for giving us some of your time this evening. Really appreciate your participation, even if it's only via the Zoom format. Hopefully, as things revert to normal, we can continue to make progress towards actually seeing one another. A couple quick field updates. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're basically closing in on completion of the biology vision project. You'll recall that was a collection of several large buildings actually located at Y-12 on land that uh, Y-12 needs for future missions. So uh, Brian Henry, who's actually speaking to you about the landfill tonight, is the project director for that project. And it's, it's, it's getting done very nicely. We're starting to get some uh, clean space for Y-12 to expand their mission. At Ornell, we've uh, completed a couple projects. One was the Tritium Target Preparation Facility. Uh, that work was actually done by a small business. And another project has been removal of a structure uh, that was part of the radioisotope development lab right in the downtown old, old section of Oak Ridge National Lab. That's a significant milestone for us. Um, we had a groundbreaking ceremony for a project that will really help us with the cleanup at Y-12. You'll hear it referred to as the West End Protected Area Reduction Project, or on occasion you'll probably hear it referred to as the WEPAR project. Fundamentally what it is, is a relocation of the security fencing and security systems so that a lot of the work that we need to get done is now outside of the fence rather than inside of the fence. That'll increase the efficiency of our work by a lot, probably 50%, and enable us to really get going in Y-12. Um, I think it's still a few years, let's see, slated for completion in 2025. So that's when they'll have everything relocated. Uh, let's see. We had a nice visit with uh, Nicole Nelson Jean, who's the, the new head for field operations within DOE. Uh, we toured her around uh, ETTP and elsewhere, and I think it's fair to say she was very pleased with what she sees happening in Oak Ridge. I got to meet with her for a little while, and she repeated multiple times that she saw Oak Ridge as kind of a leader in the cleanup business. So that was, that was very nice to hear. Um, and then just to introduce uh, the topic tonight, obviously this is something that uh, we, we care a lot about. We think that uh, ensuring the availability of adequate disposal capacity is one of the key things that enables successful cleanup. So tonight you'll be hearing about proposals to build some additional disposal capacity for demolition waste that we generate as part of the Oak Ridge cleanup. You guys have already actually given us a recommendation on this project, I think back in 2018. Um, and we're not specifically asking for another recommendation, though if you choose to submit another recommendation, that's fine. We'll always uh, be interested in and, and attuned to input from the board. Um, the last recommendation that you provided us uh, basically promoted securing funding for completion of the project, um, making sure that we had good public engagement as we proceeded with the project, and also make sure that the facility built had the capacity to expand as needed to, to accommodate all the waste we expect to generate. Now, again, I want to stress the hazardous material that we generate, or certainly the most hazardous material, be it chemical or radiological, doesn't go into this facility. It goes away. But we do need a facility that will allow us to handle all the brick and metal and wood and soils the less hazardous uh, materials 
that will be generated as part of the cleanup program. So we're happy to provide an update on that tonight, and I look forward to a good discussion on it afterwards. And with that, Shelly, I'll turn it over to the next person. Sounds great. How about you, Miss Connie? What have you got for us this evening from the EPA? Thank you, Shelly. Uh, Shell, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave basically covered a lot, and I don't have anything to add. Uh, I would like to announce that I do, Carl Frody, uh, the project manager for uh, the EMWMF and the proposed EMDF is also on the call. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And how about you, Christoph, for TDEC this evening? Good evening. You know, pleasure to participate. Uh, I have no announcements, uh, no news. Uh, I'm just uh, awaiting the presentation. Sounds great. All right. Well, uh, with no uh, further ado, let's get uh, Brian Henry introduced. For those of you that have not met Brian, he was named Y12's Portfolio Federal Director in 2016. In his role, he oversees all of the planning and the execution for Y12's current and upcoming cleanup projects, including all of the decontamination, demolition, and disposal operations. In his role, he's also leading preparations for the Mercury Treatment Facility and the Environmental Management Disposal Facility, two of OREM's largest and most vital near-term capital projects. So obviously we're really excited to hear from Brian today. Prior to his selection, he was OREM Senior Project Manager for the Environmental Management Disposal Facility, and he also served as the Interim Portfolio Federal Project Director for Y12. Before joining OREM, Henry served as the Chief of the Reservation Management Branch at DOE's Oak Ridge office, and he also led its reindustrialization program. Henry has more than 20 years of federal experience working on complex facility and utility projects, including time he spent as a civilian employee for the Navy and the Air Force. Thank you for your service, Brian. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Tennessee Tech, and he is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Tennessee. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Brian. Thank you, Shell. And I forgot to send you guys a shortened bio again, so I, I need to put that on my list so you don't have so much reading to do. Um, so I'm glad to be here again to give you guys an update on our efforts to make sure we have enough disposal capacity. I think it's been a couple of years since we talked about this. So uh, I'm happy to be here to talk about it today. Next slide. So, you know, as we're proceeding and finishing up ETTP and moving to Y12, you know, we're looking decades into the future to make sure that we have the facility necessary to support cleanup. And, you know, we, all, we operate a number of different types of landfills from sanitary um, demolition, debris, construction debris, um, and even sanitary waste. We take some waste from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, those landfills are permitted by TDEC. Um, we also have a low level radioactive waste disposal facility under CERCLA called the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility, which is operating today. As we move and look forward to Y12 and ORNL, though, we need additional capacity to have the same success at those facilities and cleaning up those facilities as we had have at ETTP. Um, so we are looking to build another low level radioactive waste disposal facility. Um, and, and you'll hear me talk about the waste hierarchy because uh, each landfill does have uh, waste acceptance criteria that determines what types of waste they can accept. Next slide. So I'm sure folks that are familiar with the Oak Ridge Site Specific Advisory Board have seen this slide a number of times. It shows the Oak Ridge Reservation, its proximity to the city of Oak Ridge, and our three major sites, the East Tennessee Technology Park, um, which the demolition has been completed there, and we're moving forward to, to cleaning up the soils and, and doing the final transition uh, of that site to the private sector. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is a premier facility for furthering the science mission for uh, the Department of Energy. The Y-12 National Security Complex, which also has a very important mission uh, in promoting and furthering national security. 
And you'll see a couple other boxes just south of the Y-12 complex. We have our Oak Ridge Reservation landfills that are permitted. Um, to the left and to the west of that is our existing environmental management waste management facility. And further down valley, um, kind of north of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory is the proposed, the site of the proposed new disposal facility called the Environmental Management Disposal Facility. You can see the Oak Ridge Reservation boundary kind of in magenta. The reservation is approximately 30,000 acres. Next slide. So I mentioned that we're transitioning from a successful uh, demolition and cleanup at the East Tennessee Technology Park. And you can see in, in the pictures here in front of you, the before cleanup, there were a lot of buildings and facilities and uh, millions of square feet of building. Um, and look at the after cleanup, the majority of those buildings are gone. All the buildings that were in the queue to be demolished have been demolished. Um, and that site's on its way to transitioning to future uses, uh, including private sector uses. And a big part of that success was the availability of the on-site disposal capacity that I talked about earlier. Next slide. So now that we're finishing up at ETTP, we, are, we have moved in earnest to doing work at Y12 and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, you heard Dave mention some successes um, this past year at, at both sites. And so we're excited to be um, working at both sites in earnest to get those sites cleaned up as well. There are over 300 buildings between the two sites. Um, the buildings at Y12 are larger, fewer in number. Um, there are more buildings at ORNL, but they're, they're not as large. And, and DOE keeps a list of all the excess contaminated facilities throughout the DOE complex, and, and that list has 254 facilities on it. And 66 of those uh, on that high priority list are located in Oak Ridge. And, and the hazards vary. They can be chemical, physical, and nuclear hazards, depending on what missions took place in those facilities and the histories of the facilities. Next slide. So the pace of our cleanup and, and the pace of the amount of waste that we generate is highly dependent on the budget we get each year. And I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, except to say, you know, Oak Ridge has been fortunate. You can see the favorable funding we've received over the last four years, which has really enabled us to move from ETTP to clean up at Y12 and ORNL. And they use different colors of money and different fund types. And, and what you see in blue, uh, you'll see that blue portion has grown significantly. And that's the type of funding, defense funding that we use to clean up Y12 and ORNL. So if we can sustain that amount of defense funding, then we can make excellent progress in cleaning up both Y-12 and ORNL. Next slide. So one important thing to note is, is all of our operating landfills are within the Oak Ridge Reservation and are located uh, within DOE controlled areas. Uh, another advantage to that is we have roads within the Oak Ridge Reservation called Hall Roads that allow us to truck the, the, the waste to these facilities and keep it out of, of the private sector. Um, and that's another huge advantage. What you see in green there, and, and there's two colors of green, so I'll call it light green. Those are our operating landfills and disposal facilities. Uh, four, five, and seven are our sanitary landfills that are permitted by TDAC. Um, EMWMF is our CERCLA disposal facility. Um, and all of the work on that facility is handled through the, the federal facility agreement and in, in coordination with our federal facility agreement partners, EPA and TDAC. Um, what you see in, in, I'm gonna call that dark green, I'm not good at naming colors, at one, two, and six, those are closed facilities. Uh, and basically we're doing maintenance on those. Um, you know, we check the caps and, and those kinds of things, I think. What you see is two and six, that might be a typo. Those may need to be switched. Um, we have done some recent work on one of those closed landfills 
um, to make sure that we continue uh, to address anything that comes up. Next slide. So across the DOE complex, um, to be successful, you need multiple paths for your waste. Um, and, and you'll hear me talk multiple times about the waste hierarchy, um, but, but we need to be, to be successful, and this is true for Oak Ridge and it's true throughout the DOE complex, we absolutely have to have those offsite disposal options. And we do also need the onsite disposal options. And when you go through the hierarchy, the first preference is re recycle or reuse the material so you don't generate waste. And then we go in a level of, of the onsite sanitary landfills, the onsite circular facility, and then shipping offsite to offsite disposal areas. Next slide. This is just to give you an indication, uh, and Dave alluded to this earlier and mentioned it. You know, basically, when you look at the uh, look at the the waste by hazard, the vast majority, and this shows you know nine over ninety nine percent by radiological activity, the majority of the hazard is shipped to those offsite disposal facilities. But as Dave mentioned, you know, after we clean out the facilities, we have a lot of building structures and soils and concrete that is much lower, has much lower contamination levels, um, but represents the larger volume that we dispose on site. Next slide. And, and we emphasize, again, as I mentioned, the waste hierarchy. And I went over this, on, it was on a previous slide about first preferences to recycle, then the sanitary landfills. But I'll point out um, landfill four, that basically takes classified waste, um, land, and it's a sanitary landfill. Landfill five, that takes the same type of waste of, of landfill four that's unclassified materials. And that's where we do take some office and cafeteria waste from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Landfill seven is our construction demolition debris. And all of those landfills are permitted by TDAC. Um, then we move to our circular waste disposal facilities. The existing one is EMWMF, and, and that does take waste that has contamination levels that preclude it from going into our sanitary landfills. Um, the proposed new disposal facility also will only accept circular waste, and it would be very similar in nature to EMWMF. Um, and then lastly, for, for waste that doesn't meet the criteria for on-site disposal, we ship that waste off-site for treatment and disposal. Next slide. So EMWMF um, opened its doors in 2002, and it's been key to the successful cleanup of ETTP. And, and while it does have some waste from Y12 and ORNL, the majority of the waste in that disposal facility um, is from the ETTP cleanup. And the agendas popped over my slides, so I can't see them entirely. There we go, thank you. Um, we did work with our regulators to increase the capacity by taking another look in, at the, the cap um, and doing a redesign of that, which allowed us to increase our capacity from 2.2 million cubic yards to 2.3 million cubic yards. And that's important because it, it allows us to have that landfill in operation for a little bit longer and bridge the gap to when EMDF will be available for disposal. Um, EMWF is about 80% full and we project it to be full in the late 2020s. And as I mentioned earlier, that's highly dependent on the budget. Um, if we don't get the budgets that we're used to, it, it could support disposal longer. Um, but we're planning for the late 2020s. Next slide. So as I mentioned, and as Dave talked about, you know, we are doing work at Y12 and ORNL, and, and that's where our focus will be on the near term. Um, as we're approaching cleanup, the majority of the time spent and the majority of the cost is associated with cleaning out a building so that it can be demolished. Um, so for the large buildings at Y12, 
it will take us a number of years to do the characterization and to clean out those buildings to get them ready for demolition, which is where the majority of the waste will be um, generated. So we have a little bit of time. We have a lot of work ahead of us at, the, at those sites to get the buildings ready for demolition, but, but we need EMDF up and operational so that we can roll right into the demolition phase. As we emphasize the waste hierarchy, we're also trying to maximize the amount of waste that goes to our, our permitted landfills. And we have done a, a fairly good job of that in recent years. Um, and so we are planning to do some build outs of the permitted capacity at our sanitary landfills. Uh, for instance, for landfill five, the permitted capacity is a little over 2 million cubic yards. We've only built out about a million cubic yards of that capacity. So we'll be expanding the built out capacity for that landfill in the coming years. And you've also heard me mention EMDF, which is our new low level waste disposal facility that will be operated under CERCLA. Um, the preferred site for that is in Central Bear Creek Valley. It will have a disposal capacity very similar to that of EMWMF. It's at 2.2 million cubic yards. We are still working through the regulatory process um, and we expect to send a D1 version of the record of decision to EPA and TDAC in July. Um, the next part of that process will be for, for those parties to review it. Um, they will generate comments. We'll have lots of discussions and in between and before we issue a D2 version of that, we'll try to reach agreement on resolution to those comments before we move forward. And as I said, we'll be submitting the D1 version in July of this year. And ideally, we would like to have two years overlap with EMWF open and EMDF available. Um, the purpose behind that is some of our waste is heavy and needs to be on the floor of the disposal cell. And as we fill up EMWMF, there are some waste streams that can't go in those upper layers. So ideally, we would like to have a two year overlap um, that time frame is getting a little tight, um, but, but that's what we're shooting for. Next slide. So this is a map of, of the Oak Ridge Reservation or a picture of the Oak Ridge Reservation and you're looking west down Bear Creek Valley. And the topography out there is basically Ridge Valley Ridge. So you see EMWMF kind of in the center of the picture and to the right of that, um, is now I've forgotten the name of the, the, the ridge, but there's the ridge right there um, to the north and there's a ridge to the south also that separates Bear Creek Valley from where ORNL sits. And in the upper left, you can see the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Spallation Neutron Source um, and the proposed site for the new EMDF is just north of that kind of in the center of the reservation in Bear Creek Valley. Um, there were a number of alternatives considered uh, for the location of, of the new disposal facility. You see one in the bottom right that was east of our existing facility. We also looked at some, some hybrid alternatives where you had smaller uh, disposal facilities in, in different sites. And we looked at a disposal facility farther down west in West Bear Creek Valley. And in working with the regulators in the proposed plan, the Central Bear Creek Valley was the selected site. Next slide. So I think the last time we presented we had uh, on this topic, we had not yet issued the proposed plan or had the public comment period. Um, that did occur uh, in the fall of 2018. Um, we've had been having community meetings all the way back to 2015 but the formal public comment period for the proposed plan ran from September of 2018 to January of 2019. And, and that period was extended uh, and was longer than the, the required public comment period. And all the comments we received during that public comment period and the responses to those comments are part of the submittal and included with the submittal of the D1 rod uh, that we will be submitted to EPA and TDEC uh, in July. Um, out of the, the public comment period and, and discussions with the state and discussions on the proposed plan, 
Um, the public's concerns and the state concerns um, were very similar and, and a lot of the focus was on um, location of the groundwater site characterization. Um, what will the waste acceptance criteria be for the new disposal facility? And oh, uh, it's no secret that at Y12, a lot of mercury was used. And, and so there was some concern about what's gonna happen with, with waste that has mercury in it. And so that was a lot of, of the theme of a lot of the comments were on those three topics. Next slide. And also in the proposed plan, it listed the state's main concern. And we've been working with EPA and TDAC um, since then to try to reach agreement on these seven issues. Um, I, I do have to acknowledge that uh, our appreciation from DOE. I, I think in the last couple of years, there's been some very good discussions um, between EPA, TDAC, um, and DOE to try to reach agreement on these ahead of us submitting the D1 rod. For the three bullets that have a, a check mark, we think that we have agreement on, on those areas for what's going into the um, D1 record of decision. Um, we did agree to incorporate a post record decision field demonstration to make sure we're all on the same page on where the groundwater levels will be uh, once the facility is constructed. Um, DOE it does have self-regulatory authority uh, for RAD waste. And we did pursue that in parallel to our work in CERCLA. Um, and that included what's called a performance assessment and a composite analysis. Um, those have been completed. That's what the PACA is. And those will be placed in the administrative record uh, for this record of decision. Um, we also agreed with the state to, to locate and find a location where no underdrain would be necessary beneath the waste footprint. And the Central Bear Creek Valley site meets that criteria. Um, we're still working through those other four um, and we'll continue to work through the, you know, reaching agreement on the applicable, relevant and appropriate regulations to include. Um, we also are having discussions on the waste acceptance criteria um, and we continue having those discussions. On mercury treatment and disposal, while we have not yet finalized an agreement there, I, I think we're very close to an agreement on mercury treatment and disposal. That would see any waste that would be characterized as hazardous waste under RICRA going offsite for treatment and disposal and applying a discharge criteria for the landfill wastewater of 51 parts per trillion, which is the recreational ambient water quality criteria. So those are the two key pieces of an agreement uh, that we're in the process of finalizing with respect to mercury treatment and disposal. Um, there was a dispute between the parties on the radiological, the radiological discharge limits for landfill wastewater. Um, that dispute did go up to the EPA administrator who issued a decision and a ruling in December of 2020. So now the three parties are working together to implement uh, the key aspects of that agreement to move forward to reach agreement on RAD discharge limits. Next slide. So I've mentioned already two of these three paths, but you know, to build a new on-site disposal facility, which is a capital line item asset project in, in DOE, we're basically moving along three different paths in parallel. Uh, I mentioned DOE's self-regulatory authority uh, for, for radiological contaminants uh, and waste that is governed by DOE order 435.1. And we had to get approval from that regulatory body um, to proceed with design and construction of the facility. We have received that authorization. It's called a preliminary disposal authorization statement. And between now and when that facility becomes operational, we have other documents that we have to get approved through that path. And we have to have approval from that body before we can accept waste in the facility. Parallel to that, we're working through the circular regulatory process. Um, I mentioned several times we're at the record of decision stage. We'll be submitting that D1 version in July. 
um, once we get through a signed record of decision, there are additional design and other CERCLA documents that have to be reviewed and agreed to by all three parties before we can start accepting waste in that facility as well. Um, the last path is basically our project management order. And so we have, have to go um, before that body and get agreement to proceed on, on capital line item asset projects. And, and those, those stages are called critical decisions. And, and we, are, we have critical decision one, which is the uh, approval of the alternatives and the cost range. Um, the next stage would be approval of what's called a performance baseline, which is CD2, and approval to start construction, which is CD3. So, you know, we're early in the process. There are a lot of approvals yet to go um, in all three of, of these processes, and there's a lot of work going on uh, to make that happen. I think that is my last slide. I think the next one will ask for questions. Okay, hey, with that, I would like to ask if anyone has questions specifically for Brian about this presentation, if you could please use the raised hand feature. And Shelly, if you can help me monitor that for any questions we might have. We do have one question. Uh, yes. Brian, did, Zach did Wilkins. You, oh, sorry. Uh, Brian, did you say MDF was the schedule to be completed by 2025, was that the goal? Uh, right now, you know, based on our, our schedule, we're thinking it's more in the 2026 timeframe um, at the earliest. Um, I don't think we can make 2025 at this point. So I think the earliest we could make is 2026 as we work along all three of those paths I mentioned. Okay, thank you. I see a hand from Thomas Frazier. Uh, he is with the Hellbender Press publication. So, Tom, can you unmute? Yes. Hey there. Uh, I appreciate the, the uh, presentation. It's very, very informative and very interesting, especially since I was a graduate of Oak Ridge High School and I've seen these things play out uh, over the past 30 years. I hate to date myself. Uh, anyway, just a couple simple questions, or as simple as they can be. Uh, just out of curiosity, what are the contaminated buildings at ORNL? I mean, we, you know, people tend to think of the mouse house and, and whatnot. Uh, is that just like structural deterioration, or what are the contaminants involved there? Uh, one other question was what y'all were seeking in a preferred. Uh, location, like from a, I don't know, geological or hydrological standpoint for the uh, proposed uh, landfill. And that's it. Thank you. So I'm going to answer the, the second um, question first. Um, and as we considered locations, there were a number of factors. Um, and the, the two you described, geological, hydrological, were, were certainly two of those, but there, were, there was a wide range of, of factors, um, land use being one, I won't go through all of them, but, but it did include the two you mentioned and a number of others. I actually am responsible for the cleanup at Y12, so I'm not as familiar with Oak Ridge National Laboratory, but I'm happy to pass that question over to Dave Adler. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Basically, the facilities at Oak Ridge National Lab that we will be cleaning up are the legacy facilities developed in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and lesser extent, 70s. As, as most are aware, Oak Ridge played a key role in the development both of experimental nuclear reactor designs and also in the development of isotope technology. Um, the purification of isotopes for various applications, be it space shots, medicine, imaging, all types of things. So the facilities that we need to address out there are old uh, defueled reactors um, and a collection of old buildings that have been involved with the uh, isolation and extraction of isotopes. As Brian mentioned before, the, the typical approach to the job is to go in and 
remove hot cells, remove you know, reactor cores or whatever, the, the areas that have the higher levels of contamination. And what this landfill would deal with is what's left. Thank you, Dave. And I believe oh, thank, that's thanks, the hand from Don John, I think I see your hand. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, Brian, uh, my question has to do with, I think it's slide nine in the pie charts and the letter that Shelley received sometime this week uh, about that. Have you seen that letter? Are you at liberty to comment on what was in that uh, letter email it was? So I'm, I'm going to defer to, to Dave on that question. I, I think that email referenced a time period before I actually worked for Oak Ridge, and Dave has a better history related to that. I'm happy to. Um, I, I assume we're talking about what I saw was actually an email from Sid Jones, who I believe is on the call tonight. Um, but anyway, the, he raised uh, some observations concerning the information available on the contents of the cell and the information that was used to produce these pie charts. Um, while it's not uncommon for people to look at a data set and have differences of opinion on what the data set says, um, we're pretty confident in, in these pie charts. Um, the material that goes into the landfill is very, very thoroughly analyzed for radioactivity and chemical hazards. In fact, I think you'd be very, very hard pressed to find another landfill in Tennessee or perhaps the nation where so much money has been spent on chemical and radiological characterization of the landfill's contents. We spend millions and millions of dollars characterizing waste prior to making decisions on whether or not it can go into the landfill and assuring that we have good information on what is in the landfill. Um, and of course, the, the sampling plans that are used to drive all of this characterization activity have to be approved by both the state and EPA um, prior to their, for, for the most part, prior to their application. So hopefully that provides some confidence with the public it's not just DOE deciding how to characterize the waste, but it's DOE and the state and EPA. So while I don't you know, want to go point by point through Sid's note, we could do that in some other form, I suppose. Um, I just wanted to stress that our perspective is that these charts are right, that the larger volume of material by far um, is relatively low hazard material and that the radioactivity that is in concentrated form is being shipped out west. Thank you. Uh, Shell, we do have another question from Mr. Doug Kulklisher. Uh, I believe he's just on the phone. He asks, can the materials from the gas-cooled reactor that was never operational be recycled and to what extent can the landfill be avoided by recycling of steel and other things? So, so I will take a stab at that and probably should defer to Dave. I, I think that's an ORNL facility. But in general, um, DOE has a um, moratorium on recycle of materials if they were inside a radiological area. So if, if that facility has materials that were never inside of a radiological area and can be screened to be clean, then they are available to be recycled. So Dave, do you wanna to add to that? Uh, there's not much to add um, other than we do place an emphasis on recycling wherever possible. Um, we, a lot of our jobs involve recycling of uh, metals in particular, but there are constraints on, on what we can recycle because we have very, very strict uh, requirements to not recycle any metal that may have become contaminated. There are a collection of reasons for that, but it, it has to do with concerns that contaminated metal might make it into the re uh, recycled waste streams 
and damage the recycling industry. So we need to be very careful about that. But short answer is that if the material is eligible for recycling, then we will recycle it. Mr. Fraser, if you could unmute. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> You'd think I'd get the hang out, hang of it after using it for months. Uh, a quick question on the uh, actual structural makeup and components of the new uh, dump uh, to ensure that obviously it doesn't disseminate, the contents don't disseminate to the external environment. Uh, and were there any, changes made from uh, previous uh, such landfills? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So um, RICRA subtitle C landfills have a very prescriptive and defined criteria for your liner systems. Um, and so the EMWMF and EMDF both follow that. Um, so in general, at the bottom of the landfill, you'll have a 10 foot thick geologic buffer. The idea is to separate the waste from the groundwater. Um, you'll have about a three foot thick clay liner. You'll have a leachate collection system and also a leak detection system. And those uh, also include geomembranes between the layers. So what you basically wind up with is 15 feet uh, when you include the geologic buffer and the liner system and the leachate and leak detection systems um, between the waste and where the water is. Um, and, and because it's those follow the RICRA subtitle C, um, both landfills have that same setup. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not, uh, we're not hearing Harriet. She's one of our members. I will. Oh, I, I raised my hand and waiting for somebody to acknowledge me. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. It doesn't show that my hand goes up because I don't have my uh, participants listed. Sorry about that. Um, I know I've heard in the past what this, this membrane is, but could Brian kind of refresh my memory is, I think of a membrane as a very tiny thing and he's talking about feet. So I just need some clarity. Well, a, a, a geomembrane um, isn't feet. It's, uh, it's like a plastic geotech or geotextile membrane on the order of, um, and I may get this wrong because it's, it's on 60 or 80 millimeters thick. Okay. Um, if you think about just a sheet of plastic that you could buy at Lowe's or something, that's typically, um, you know, four to eight mils thick. So it's about, 10 times thicker than that type of material. Thank you. Shelly, I do have a question that come in from Doug Kolklisher. There are a number of water table wells associated with the proposed EMDF site. Do any of the test wells flow unaided during heavy rains as have occurred over the past five years? So the answer to that would be no. Um, we do have a number of wells that we put in uh, as part of a characterization effort. Um, and they're used to estimate the, the current groundwater levels. 
Um, now, where the, the site is going to be constructed, you have a huge knoll area um, kind of in the north northern portion of the site. You have a, a, a depressed saddle to the north where you have a land that is lower than where the bottom of the waste would be. You have two tributaries to the east and west where the, the land is lower um, than the waste would be. And then to the south, the, the land slopes down as you go toward the creek. Um, you know, how far below the surface the groundwater is um, depends on the seasons and the proximity to the drainage tributaries. You know, as you get closer to the drainage tributaries, um, the water, the groundwater levels are closer to surface um, and near surface at certain times of the year. Um, as you get up into the knolls, um, the groundwater is certainly deeper. Uh, we have about two years of data uh, on those wells um, that, that we use as part of our discussion with EPA and TDAC. Shelly, do you have any other questions? Hello. I believe we have maybe a question from Thomas Fraser again. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. When I have to switch to deal with the agenda, I don't always unmute myself, right? <laughs> Go ahead, hey, Thomas. Uh, Hey, uh, I don't mean to monopolize the questioning or anything, but um, uh, it, it, what is the worst case scenario for this, for the uh, local environment? I mean, have there been any instances of uh, similar uh, landfills or dumps of mildly radioactive debris occurring uh, before? And one other quick question, uh, where, to the extent you're able to tell me, is the... Um, off-site waste transported. So I'll answer the, the, the first question. Um, and I wouldn't compare DOE facilities to other radioactive disposal facilities. Um, you know, for DOE facilities, we have a very rigorous process that we go through that involves uh, defense in depth and, and analysis. You know, I talked about the performance assessment and the composite analysis to make sure we're designing a facility that does not um, have a negative impact to the environment or the public. Um, that's part of the process is to ensure that does not occur. In addition to our process within DOE, you know, the circle process and working with EPA and TDAC, um, as we go through that rocket regulatory process, it's also there to ensure that we build a facility that is safe and does not have impacts. Um, CERCLA also includes monitoring. So after the facilities are, are built, um, there are monitoring wells to, to make sure that there's not an issue uh, in or around those facilities. And if there are, that corrective actions can be taken such that there is no significant negative impact um, to the public or the environment. And Dave may have a better answer to that question uh, on where the offsite waste goes. Typically, um, there are waste disposal facilities out in Nevada and Utah, and there's one in Texas that can take uh, low-level radioactive waste. Dave, I'll, I'll yeah. defer to you. I'm, I'm going to add in just a little bit, if you don't mind, Brian. Um, first of all, Thomas, don't worry about the mute button. I've been doing this for about a year, and I'm still only about 50-50 on getting it right. So. Um, you know, the worst case scenario is limited by the type of waste that goes into the facility. So, again, we're talking about building demolition material from buildings that are currently, you know, literally sitting out in the rain on top of the soil out in the environment next to the creek. And the basic proposition is to uh, free them of their most hazardous components, demolish them and then put them in a, in a place away from the creek, kind of on a, on a, at the base of a ridge, and then wrap them up in clay. 
So probably the very worst case scenario is we never succeed in doing that. But once it's put into the landfill, the, the, the worst case hazard analyses don't give you particularly difficult scenarios. I mean, if there were to be some leakage from the facility, hopefully our leak detection systems and the groundwater monitoring wells would detect that leakage and we'd be in a position to implement some type of corrective action. Um, the, the cell is, uh, its protectiveness is dependent on maintenance of the cap, the, the, the final cap that we put over the landfill, also a lot of clay and multi-layer, uh, mul multiple components. If that cap becomes compromised, dries out and cracks where there's a, some type of geologic event that results in the cap being damaged and no longer serving as an effective barrier to infiltration. Um, the worst case scenario is we have to go and fix the cap, which is pretty common practice these days. All, all the municipal landfills around the state require that you maintain caps. So that's not unique to this facility. So that's just a little bit of additional perspective on the long-term considerations with the facility. Thank you. I have a question. Can you state your name Hello. and go ahead? Hey, this is Leon Baker. I was asking a question. We were mentioning that there were 66 buildings on the list slated for demo. So we're saying that based on the budget, that number can increase or decrease. Is that what we're saying, Brian, on that? It was a good presentation, enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think that was 16 facilities that are on DOE's list of excess contaminated facilities. There are more facilities mm -hmm. at Y-12 and Oak Ridge that are part of our long-term cleanup efforts. And I think what adequate funding does is allows us to get that cleanup done sooner, right? Um, if, if our budgets go down, we still are planning to clean up the areas, it will just take us longer. So, you know, much like we finished up ETTP, we'd like to, to finish up Y-12 and ORNL cleanup in the 2040s or late 2040s. Um, if the budgets are there, I think that's doable. Um, if the budgets are not, it would stretch out a little bit or a lot, depending on how low the budgets were. Great. Great, thank you very much. I believe I see a raised hand, Miss Virginia Dale. So much, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could provide some more information about the process for determining the waste acceptance criteria. This is critical since so much of uh, your answers depend on what goes out west and what stays um, on site. Sure. Um, and this will be part of, um, we are going to, you know, so there's two, two answers to that. So, you know, you have waste except, there's a number of different types of waste acceptance criteria. Um, you have analytical waste acceptance criteria and that comes from modeling such as, as supported the performance assessment and composite analysis. Um, you can have administrative waste acceptance criteria. Um, as an example, um, you know, we were trying to improve on some and take into account some of the lessons learned from EMWMF, but in the record of decision, you will see as specific administrative criteria, um, the class C limits for, for contaminants. So even if, if our analysis didn't, didn't say that we needed to have a limit on those, there'll be an administrative limit based on the class C criteria. Um, if, we if we work with EPA and TDEC and, and reach agreement on a limit on a specific contaminant, that can also be an administrative limit. Um, that was done for EMWMF on the limit for uranium. Um, so, so it's a combination of factors. Uh, it, it, the resulting waste acceptance criteria comes about um, and is, will be part of agreements between the EPA, TDEC, and DOE. 
And I will say, you know, there's also a primary circular document that follows the record of decision that goes into detail, um, all the details on how we implement the waste acceptance criteria um, as well. So there'll be some information agreed to in the record of decision. After that, there will be a circular document uh, that will provide a further level of detail on how the waste acceptance criteria is implemented. Does that answer your question? Well, some of it, but I think we'll have to see the record of decision to really have um, the full answers. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions? We are a little over time here, so we do need to move to public comment. As a reminder, we will continue to accept questions and comments on this meeting through Monday. Um, so if you think of something or if something wasn't addressed, please do email us. It's ORSSAB at orem.doe.gov, and I can put that in the chat as well. With that, Shelley, I believe let's go ahead and move on to the public comment period. My understanding is that any comments were to be submitted prior to the meeting. Do you have any to read into the record today, Shelley? Uh, we do actually have two comments. Um, one is from Ms. Dale and another is from Mr. Coquisher. So hold on just a moment. I will put those up. So our first is from Mr. Colclisher, and I don't believe we have time to read all of it, but the main points uh, will I'll show you below. Mr. Colclisher had asked if there had been a hard RFQ cost quote requested for the offsite disposal from contractors such as energy solutions. Uh, Mr. Colquisher said that he has done some discussion with Jay Mullis on this topic uh, of some economic analysis, but he would like to know to what extent the estimate had been substantiated by a quote. Um, he also asked if the board had addressed the, uh, a letter communicated by the Southern Environmental Law Center that letter is attached in the meeting um, documents, and I'm happy to forward that to anyone who has trouble locating it. And then specifically on our EMDF project, uh, he says the proposed on-site disposal option have a number of aspects that um, may need additional consideration in cost or technical factors on the proposed plan. And then we will go to, uh, Dave, do you wanna address any of those or we can forward those to the experts for some additional email that I can give back to Mr. Kokosher? Uh, the latter, please. I wanna do it properly, thanks. Okay, and uh, Ms. Dale, who is the president of Advocates for the Oak Ridge Reservation, uh, wanted to share with the board a letter that her organization, as well as the Tennessee chapter of the Sierra Club, um, sent to Secretary Graham, um, Department of Energy Secretary Graham, regarding the EMDF project. The full letter is um, longer than our allotted time for an individual comment, but she did note that there were four sections that they had highlighted uh, for details of waste acceptance criteria, um, details of the comparative analysis of costs and jobs for on-site and off-site alternatives, waivers of regulatory requirements that would be needed for on-site options and uh, rationale for those waivers, and a question on what treatment technologies have been evaluated or planned to reduce waste volume and to immobilize any mercury waste.
those are the only public comments we received to include with the meeting packet. However, again, um, if you have any other comments you would like to be included on the record, please feel free to email those to us through uh, close of business 5 p.m. on Monday. Kelly, if I could just throw in, uh, I assume we'll be developing responses to all the uh, uh, communications received, but on the waste acceptance criteria uh, issue and public engagement, there is a plan to have a workshop on that or some type of public forum for discussing, describing and discussing waste acceptance criteria. I don't know exactly when that's scheduled for. We do still have a little bit of work to do with the state and EPA to make sure that we come to a, a consensus on what to propose to the public. Um, but, but people can look forward to that discussion. Great, thanks, Dave. Okay, great. Thank you. This concludes the public comment portion of the, the meeting this evening. I'd like to call for any additions to the agenda. If we have no additions, I'd like to move to approve the agenda. I second that. First. Thank you, Leon. And a second. A second. Thank you, Leon. Number two. Can we raise hands? Shelly, is that the right, the, I guess the best way to raise hands to approve? You yes, that's, that's how we've been doing it. The uh, raise hand to approve. Okay, great. Um, if you cannot use the raise hand function, please mention something in the chat window. Or uh, if you are solely on the phone, please, um, I is fine. Aye. Uh. Are we good to move forward, Shelly? Do you have a tally? So we have eight eyes. Um, I'm actually looking to see exactly how many board members we have here tonight. Okay, it looks like that is the majority. Um, does anyone not wish to approve the agenda or? So I'm seeing there are four people with hands up. Is that to not approve the agenda or have you not dropped your hands from previous? Georgette and Leon. Leon, Leon said I. Oh, <laughs> uh, that Leon Shield. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so any any objections to approving the agenda? I see no hands. Okay. With that, we will um, move forward. Um, any requests for new action items from anyone? With no action items being requested, we'll let everybody know the next meeting will be on June 9th. And the topic that we'll be covering is groundwater remedies specifically at ETTP. And we'll be looking forward to Doug Adler's presentation on the topic. As a reminder for the board members, those that are serving on the groundwater issue group, are Amy Jones, myself, Harriet McCurdy, Samaras, Shields, Shoemaker, Swindler, and Tap. And if any other members want to uh, join in on this issue group, just let us know either in the chat or via email. This ends the presentation portion of the meeting. Presenters and subject matter experts are welcome to depart. Thank you for joining this evening. We'll give just a minute to let folks depart and then we'll get going.
Okay. Seen a substantial reduction in our participants here. All right, let's go ahead and get going. I'm going to ask Miss Bonnie to go ahead and um, share uh, with us the February and March minutes motions to approve. And Shelly, I'm just noticing I don't see Bonnie. It looks like we may have lost her. I think you're right. Uh, if you want to, you or Leon would take that over. That sounds great. Leon, do you want to take that or do you want me to? It doesn't matter either way. I don't have it in front of me, but I think the uh, members should have seen it. So you may just open the floor for a possible motion for approval or denials. That sounds great. We have a motion to approve the said minutes that was sent out. Motion to approve. Motion that be approved. We have a motion and a second from uh, Mr. Tapp and Leon. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. <laughs> I know that I is from Leon Baker. <laughs> That's right, I. <laughs> Madam Chairman, it appears that the minutes have been approved. Thanks. If everyone could lower your hand. Do we want to do a separate motion for the March meeting minutes as well? Motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Mr. Tapp, do we have second. a second? Second. All a, uh, motion and a second. All those in favor of raising it. Aye. Uh. <laughs> Madam Chairman, we have an approval on the uh, March minutes as well. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so our next item of discussion is a motion, a potential motion to approve the recommendation on the budget priorities. That recommendation has been provided in your packet. Shelly is also sharing that recommendation on the screen. Um, John, I don't know if you wanna take a minute to just talk through the recommendations that were presented by the EM committee before we move forward with any in entertaining of a motion? I can do that. The recommendations that were in the packet are being presented tonight are the result of two uh, EM stewardship committee meetings. The first one in March where we discussed and formulated uh, some recommendations. And then in the uh, April meeting, we went through those and made some um, minor edits and the EM Stewardship Committee uh, passed the recommendation on to the Executive Committee that these be presented to the board at tonight's meeting. The uh, Executive Committee last week at their meeting uh, approved putting those on the agenda for tonight. And just briefly, there were five recommendations and I'll go through those quickly. Uh, number one is to complete transfer of all applicable land parcels at ETP for productive purposes. We had a, quite a bit of discussion about that. Uh, productive purposes would not necessarily just be industrial usage or, but could also be recreational uses or whatever are appropriate and productive, and then conduct, continue working with the community partners to fully realize the economic development potential of reindustrialization. Second one was to provide additional funding to uh, operate uh, needed on-site disposition facility to allow continued uninterrupted cleanup progress. And you've heard a lot about that tonight, so. That's nothing new. A third recommendation was to increase funding where possible for the mercury treatment facility to try to get it on the original schedule of 2025 as originally presented to the community. Whereas I think now maybe the official schedule is sometime in the late 2020s. Uh, fourth one was the expansion of the Aquatic Ecology Laboratory because of its survival nature in studying the mercury. 
situation and to prioritize uh, designing and testing new and improved remediation technologies. And the fifth was to uh, provide adequate funds to maintain or upgrade infrastructure to ensure safe transportation of waste from cleanup projects to disposal. So with those five recommendations, I will move that the board approve these for transmission to uh, Department of Energy. I'll second that nomination. Second. All of those in favor, raise your hand. Shelly, you let me know when you have an accurate count. Uh, looks like we have 10 people for that. Uh, anyone not uh, approve of that or need further discussion? I believe I've lowered everyone's hand. So if you, you do not approve, please raise your hand. Okay, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, I wanna say a, a huge thank you to the EM Stewardship Committee. I know a lot of hard work was put into this recommendation and I appreciate all of the conversation and the back and forth discussion around this to make sure it was a great recommendation for the board to put forth. So thank you all, well done. Our next item on the agenda is um, an item related to the headquarter charges on outreach and in-state cleanup. As most board members are likely aware, in April we held a um, the spring chairs meeting where the SSAB boards came together to share information about how things are going with each of our facilities and talk about next steps and best practices. And part of what came out of our previous meeting was aligning on a couple of charges that have been asked of us from headquarters relative to things that they need from us for a recommendation. The first of those charges is to develop a best practice white paper that the department could use as a guide to augment existing outreach programs and set expectations for future activities. As the board is aware, we did develop some recommendations for our board and now we're being asked to come together as a national board to really solidify what that looks like in one view. The second charge is to identify SSAB 10 year expectations and guiding principles that could be used as a complex wide framework for DOE's EM interaction with stakeholders and communities. Again, we did develop some recommendations that we've been looking at here at Oak Ridge and have put those forward to the board for consideration. Each of these charges have been assigned a subcommittee to really kind of develop the in-state product for each of these that will go to the National SSAB. Um, I have not um, opted to opt to work on the first charge. However, I did um, sign up to work on the second charge of, of identifying the expectations and guiding principles for stakeholder engagement. So that said, I also want to offer anyone on the board the opportunity to engage in these charge um, development opportunities as well. This is open to any member of the board that wants to participate. So if you have an interest in learning more, I think this is a really fantastic opportunity for anyone that may want to consider a board seat in the future, an executive committee seat. I would highly recommend taking part in this activity. And so with that, I'm just gonna open it up briefly for questions about those charges. And if there's anything else I can provide about that, and then point everyone back to the 10 year vision document um, that was provided as well as the meeting that took place last week. We can have some discussion about that as well. Any questions or thoughts for entertainment? You can just raise your hand, that'd be great. Okay, 
with that, I don't see any questions, so we'll move forward. Just a reminder um, that we have issue group signups that are still ongoing, and I wanted to put out um, open to everyone that if there is an opportunity or you're not signed up for a group yet and you'd like to sign up for a group, we can do those now. If you want to express some interest, Shelly, if you want to let us know where we may need some additional participation, or you can shoot an email to us after the meeting. Shelly, do you have a list handy of where we still need some support? So at the moment, um, we have this topic, which as, as Mr. Adler had said, you know, DOE is not specifically looking for a recommendation. Shelly, did you accidentally mute? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> So we, we have this issue, the EMDF, and we have next month's issue on, on groundwater. Those are our two opportunities right now. Uh, if you look on the agenda right now, we have um, you, Ms. Lohman, Harriet McCurdy, um, Marite Perez, Leon Shields, Bonnie Shoemaker, Fred Swindler, and John Tapp, who have signed up for the EMDF topic. Uh, anyone else, if you would like to join, you know, uh, send me a message in chat or send me an email and we can add you. Also on the agenda is the groundwater current signups. Um, Amy Jones, Michelle Lohman, Harriet McCurdy, George, Georgette Samaras, Leon Shields, Bonnie Shoemaker, Fred Swindler, and John Tapp. Um, again, if you would like to join that, please do let us know. We do prefer that all the members participate in at least one or preferably two um, recommendations during their membership each year. However, we understand that this year has been a little different and we do have you know, a few fewer meetings to have participated in. Thank you, Shelly. If anyone has any interest in those groups, please make sure to let us know. Those are great learning opportunities for folks particularly those new to the board. With that, we'll transition over to responses to recommendations and the alternate DDFOs report. Ms. Melissa, do you have anything for us today? Uh, just a couple things. I wanna thank you for your budget recommendation. Uh, we don't have any other open recommendations at this point. I wanted to give you a quick update on where our new member package was. As I had talked at the last meeting, we had gotten our member package sent back to us and they wanted us to uh, look at a few more uh, candidates to add to the package. Uh, we have now gone out, done some more canvassing. We've come up with a new package. We've submitted that draft package to headquarters. Uh, they sent that back to us today saying that it is okay for us to go ahead and submit. Now, this is just the preliminary stage. We had made it through this preliminary stage last time. So, but anyway, I, um, I put the paper through, uh, put the paperwork through and it was going through concurrence today. It will either have been signed this afternoon by Laura Wilkerson for Jay Mullis, or if she was not able to sign it, it will be signed by Jay tomorrow. So we'll be re resubmitting our new package. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. And so next up for committee reports, John, anything you want to share for EM stewardship beyond the budget recommendation? The only good question I would ask Shelly maybe is just kind of a procedural question. When we were meeting in person, we were trying to maybe get the issue groups to meet a little bit earlier. Uh, before prior to the meeting, are we going to try to continue with doing that uh, since we're meeting virtually now? So what we have been doing is I've been sending out an email introduction um, and kind of some background on each recommendation to the issue group. And it is totally up to the issue group if they want to meet. We are happy to set up a Zoom for them, or you know they are welcome to also meet together uh, you know, without staff assistance. It's just, it's completely up to those members how they want to do that. Well, I guess we'll, it, it, would it be the issue group to give a recommendation as to whether we make a recommendation or not? 
um, if the issue group decides that no recommendation is needed, that is something that they could discuss at the EM Stewardship Committee. And then, you know, we could forward that opinion to the officers just like we would a recommendation. And it could certainly be discussed at uh, the next board meeting as well. Yeah. I think all the officers are on the issue group. So <laughs> I guess that'll get resolved pretty quick. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shelly. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. John. The executive committee did meet last week. Really, the majority of the meeting was spent debriefing relative to the chair's meeting and the charges that we've been assigned. Um, for those that have interest or maybe want to take part in the work that um, I'm personally doing with the, the second charge, there is a meeting next week. So if you'd like to participate, just let myself or Shelly know and we can get you that invite. Um, we did go over the work plan and, and just really kind of took some consideration relative to how that's going to look for the rest of the year. As you know, we'll have our meeting in June and there is not another meeting until the August, September timeframe and whether or not that will be an in-person annual meeting or, or not remains to be seen. So I would just say, you know, more to come relative to what that's going to look like. As soon as we get some insight from DOE, we'll certainly let everybody know. I'd like to call for any additions to the agenda. Any additional business? Okay, well, I thank everyone so much for your participation. I know these Zoom meetings are not ideal and there's a lot involved. Uh, it can be very busy, if you will, working with the chat and raising the hands and putting the hands down. Um, so we really appreciate everyone's willingness to engage in this way. This is how we're, we're really gonna be able to keep things moving forward until we are ready finally to get back fully in person. And I will tell you, I'm really looking forward to that day. <laughs> so um, with that, I will close the meeting. Meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone and have a great evening. Bye.